And I know there's a few of you who weren't here to get your exam back. Um, we went over it and ran out of the computer. The laptop <laughs> kicked off, so we had to quit class early yesterday or Wednesday. But if you weren't here to get your test, um, my point's going to be it's in my, um, not my dead file, but kind of my dead file. So you need to stop by my office and pick it up. Dead files? <laughs> Could be. So, oh, are you okay? <laughs> coffee? Oh, I have an eye wash in the cam lab. Do you need to flush out? She got coffee in her eye. Oh, jeez. It was warm. So we're going to continue on the theme that we started out with Chapter 4, which is how much water vapor there is in the air. Okay, or how much, yeah, water there is in the air. Water vapor, water gas in the air. So actually I brought these <coughs> cheesy looking things to, um, for you guys to measure the humidity in here. But have you ever noticed how your hair actually responds to mm -hmm. <laughs> humidity or lack of humidity? Okay. So um, they're actually, to measure humidity is called a, a hygrometer. So there's a, this is a hair hygrometer. It's not people hair, but I think it's horse hair. Or not says human hair. Okay, human hair and horse hair. Basically, it gets kinky and it relaxes, and then it will make the little needle go up or down, and then you can turn that into how much moisture there is in the air. So that's kind of fun. Now, what I handed out though is the <laughs> next thing. It's called a sling psychrometer. Does it does it feel like you can sling it? Sling psychrometer. Okay, that's the slinging part of the sling psychrometer. <laughs> and it's just another way to measure. Oh, isn't isn't that like almost therapeutic? It is. <laughs> That's another way to measure measure humidity. But do you notice that there's a, there's two thermometers, but the one underneath is different than the one on top. The one underneath has what we call should have a little sock. Mm -hmm. So here's the deal: if you've ever gotten wet, well, we've all get wet. Hopefully, we take <laughs> baths, right? But you get this kind of cooling sensation when you're wet, and the reason is because, and actually we talked about how perspiration cools you off, so it's the same thing. The reason you get a cooling sensation basically is because the thermal energy of your skin is basically taking that liquid water and vaporizing it. And that takes a certain amount of energy to do that, and the energy is at the expense of your arm. <laughs> your arm loses heat in doing that. So the way these work is, I'll go ahead and show this whole slide. I'm gonna, I am going to bring around some water. So you're going to dip both thermometers in, but the one with the wetted sock is going to hold the most water, okay? So the way you're going to do it is you'll dip your little, it's kind of like communion wafers. Just the one. <laughs> um, I think dip both of them. It should work okay. Dip both of them in. Okay. And then, like the instructions say, well, I don't know if the instructions say it, but you're going to sling it for, oh, maybe count to 10, 10 to 20, sling it. And then stop and write down on a piece of paper what both thermometers read. So dip it in here, sling it for 20 seconds, and then write down, <laughs> write down what your thermometers say. Wow. And if they're not, if they're not, oh, you stop pushing the face of water. And I'm gonna jump down what you guys have. Dude. Oh my nose. Yeah, they get kind of wet. And honestly, when I worked in the um, at the Iowa Army Ammunition Plant, they used to check humidity out in the plant, but they wouldn't. Um, I'll let you guys see. <laughs> but they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't sling it. They would have a fan ventilated instead of slinging it. Okay. So I'm going to put a column over here, and I'm going to write down what y'all got. Now I'm, first, I'm going to ask for what your dry, your one without the thermometer said. That's what we call your dry bulb temperature. And then I'm going to ask for your wetted sock temperature. So let's see. Dry. And I'm going to say wetted. I know they're both wetted, but one has the sock. Okay, Autumn, what you got? Uh, 19 on dry. Mm -hmm. And 14. Ooh. 15 on wet. We'll go with 14. And the deal is, is that the lower the, the, the wetted sock temperature is, that means you could have more evaporation. 
And you can only have lots of evaporation if the air is pretty dry. And so there's a table in a minute to find these on. Okay, what did you got, Chelsea? Um, weather is 12. Very good. And then dry is 20. 20, all right, very good. Ashley? I got 20 on dry. 20 on dry, and what about your wetted? Um, 11. 11? Perfect. Um, 20 on dry. 16. I just think this is so interesting that, I mean, it's cooler. The wet one is cooler than the other one. Um, okay, what'd you get? I got 19 on dry. Okay. 15 on wet. Very good. I got 18 and I got 14. 18 and 14? Perfect. 20 dry, 16 wet. 20 dry, 16 wet. Very good. Okay. So let's see, let's look at some tables. So this actually, it's a little fancier than y'all had, but it's the same thing, okay? Notice that they had one with the sock and one without a sock, and they dipped it in water just like y'all did, okay? So here's the table we would look at to get, um, this one is going to give us dew point temperature. The next one's going to give us humidity. So let's just kind of take an average, um, 20, <laughs> okay? And an average here, maybe. I think 16 because it has the most. Yeah, but we want the most depression, so 16 would be. So I'm thinking 15. Let's go with that. Okay, let's see if we can find those and see what the, the dew point um, temperature would be. So we see the dry bulb temperature, we're going to go with 20. Now, the thing along the top actually is the depression. So actually, 20 minus 15 is 5. So actually, our, our depression is 5. And that's along the top. Yeah. So we find 20 along the kind of y-axis-ish. And we find 5 up here. And we see where they intersect. Yep. Okay. So 12 then would be the temperature we would need to cool down in order for the air in here to become saturated. Okay. 12 degrees Celsius from 20, we need to go 8 degrees, and then we would go ahead and get condensation. But the next table does a similar thing, but it's relative humidity instead of dew point temperature. So again, we find our 20 and we find our five and see where they intersect. I get 58. Yep, so that would be 58% is the RH. So in this room, seems reasonable. Very good. Okay, I'll go ahead and collect those back up again. I know. So, Oh, that was my little reminder. I think I already reminded you guys about Tuesday. It already went up? It already went up? Yeah, the driving wheel went up just sitting there. Okay, we have our uh, kind of our work cut out for us today. Do you guys remember this slide that actually, it's a figure that we talked about. How do you quantify? How do you say how much water vapor there is in the, in the air? And earlier in Chapter 4, we said you can do it with uh, mixing ratio or absolute humidity. Okay. Maybe. This one? This one? Oh, this one. This one? This one. Okay. Yeah, did everybody get the missing word on here? Did you get it? Yeah, if I go too fast, let me know. I apparently went too fast for that one. Okay. <laughs> we were, you guys were playing with your toys. Okay, so we need to talk about cooling chunks of air. So now one of the things that's going to help you in this discussion coming up is that just like kind of we have an invisible boundary around this chunk of air, you kind of need to think along those terms. One of the things, uh, it wasn't an invisible boundary, but remember we said, we watched that video when the guy, the dude sends up the weather balloons and the balloon gets about the size of a house. 
Okay, think of that as actually any chunk of air as it rises. It's basically going to be up against thinner and thinner air, less and less pressure, and it's going to get bigger. It just will. Okay. So the thing about it, though, is as it gets larger, it is going to cool. As it gets larger, it's going to cool. And I'm going to try to convince you of that. But one of the things about anything getting larger is it takes a little bit of work for something to get larger. And work is awesome, but work doesn't just happen. It needs to be funded by something. And honestly, we say it's funded by kind of the kinetic energy of the gas itself, so it cools down. So that's basically what it is. So we talked earlier in Chapter 4 that um, and the dew point temperature, okay, if you go ahead and cool something down to dew point temperature, you can go ahead and get condensation. And that's what we're talking about, basically. Taking a chunk of air, it rising, it getting larger and cooling, and then we can go ahead and have condensation within that chunk of air, which if it's high enough, that would be a cloud. Okay, so we're kind of talking about cloud formation. <clears throat> so um, an isolated system, like I'm describing, that chunk of that parcel of air is isolated, it's by itself. If it goes ahead and it changes its temperature just because it's expanding, we actually call that an adiabatic process. The reason is basically no, it's cooling, but it basically no energy eked out across its invisible boundary. It's cooling just in and of itself, within itself, okay? So that's adiabatic. Diabatic is the opposite. We do a lot of diabatic heating. When you put something on the stove, basically that system might be your pan of water. And you heat it, basically you put energy into it from the outside. That's diabatic, okay? So diabatic is when you add or remove heat from your little chunk of interest. Adiabatic is your chunk of interest just kind of heats or cools on its own. In this case, a chunk of air is going to cool on its own because it's expanding. And actually, if a chunk of air is contracting, it will heat up. So that's, that's adiabatic. So less space so they bounce it's, around? Or? Well... The reason it, there's a couple ways probably to look at it, but if you just talk about expansion is work and contraction, okay, expansion okay. is it's doing work and contraction is work is being done on it. Okay. Um, if it's doing work, then it, work needs to be funded, and it'll be funded by the thermal energy right. of the particles. If work's being done on it, actually it'll heat those particles up. Yeah. They say warm air rises, though. Well, we, we're going to talk about okay. that. Actually, that's like, that coming up. Backwards. Yeah. Everything oh, no. seems backwards to me. Some things do seem backwards in physical science. Um, so this is my slide to kind of tell you what I just told you a minute ago. <coughs> a chunk of air is going to expand, and expansion is work, and work needs to be paid for paid forward by something, and it's actually paid forward by the kinetic energy of the molecules themselves, or part of gas particles. We call that adiabatic cooling because it's the chunk itself that's doing it. It's nothing, no energy is passing that invisible boundary either way. Adiabatic cooling. So um, I think I'm going to erase this and draw a few things on the board. For your test for unit uh, one, one of the things I wanted you guys to generally know is the ELR, environmental lapse rate. In general, and I'll go ahead and put it up here. It's 6.5, right. The ELR is basically you send up a weather balloon, and in general, now this is just very, very, very general, it, the atmosphere is going to cool at 6.5 <laughs> degrees Celsius per kilometer. Perfect. So if this is my ground down here, and each mark is one kilometer, you know, if you start at zero, then it'll go to what, negative 6.5? Thank you, negative 13, negative 19.5, very good. Okay, that's the approximate environmental lapse rate. I'm going to talk about another lapse rate. It's called the dry adiabatic rate, or the DAR. Let's see, I think I got one over here. So here's the deal now. I'm going to go ahead and draw another kind of deal. But I'm going to go ahead, and this is going to be our chunk of air. Okay. And the dry adiabatic rate 
is the rate at which a parcel of air will cool as it rises one kilometer. <laughs> I don't know. I do. <laughs> so, and it is more in stone, a lot more in stone. 10 degrees Celsius is how much it'll cool for every kilometer it rises. So here we go. Um, and by the, by the way, the reason it expands in the first place is one of the things you told me on your unit exam is the air gets thinner as you go up. Less pressure, basically it expands into that lower pressure. So here we go. So here's your chunk of air, and it's going to rise one kilometer. And notice it went from 32 to 22. It cooled 10 degrees Celsius. The next kilometer, how, will, how cool will it be? Cool 10 more degrees. 12 degrees, exactly. I like doing the subtract for a second. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Me neither. 10 more degrees it'll cool, so it kind of up at 3,000 meters or 3 kilometers, same thing, it's going to be at 2 degrees according to this rate, the dry adiabatic rate. Expanding and cooling, expanding and cooling. Right? So um, as it rises, it will expand and it will cool, and I think I mentioned Sometimes, and we'll be talking more about this later, a chunk of air actually will descend. As it descends, there's greater and greater pressure, and it contracts. So work is done on it, so it heats up. So that guy who jumped out of that orbital, that platform of his, would have probably been a popsicle? I don't know. It'd be pretty cold up there. Jesus. That's right. Lots of different, I mean, was he jump out of, like, mid-stratosphere? So. Yeah, he definitely had his fair share of temperature swings. Yeah. Because in the stratosphere, yeah, it started to yeah, get warmer. Mm -hmm. I agree. So with all this cooling going on, you know, it went from, um, what do we say? It went from 32 to 22 to 12 to 2, okay? It cools down, yeah. But here's the deal. If anywhere in here, say the dew point... Say the dew point temperature of this chunk of air was 12. Guess what? Right here, if the dew point temperature was 12 right here, you would see condensation beginning if the dew point temperature was 12. Why? Because it cooled to the dew point temperature. Okay. Yep. And that elevation is actually on this slide. We call this the LCL the lifting, because you lift that chunk of air up, condensation because it's condensing, level. So the lifting condensation level is the elevation you need to go ahead and lift a chunk of air up to go ahead and get it cooled down to begin forming a cloud. It's wonderful. That's, this actually, too, is why the base of most clouds are flat, especially if they're kind of new clouds. They're not kind of fluffy on the bottom. They're flat, and they might be fluffy on the top. All right. Well, we need to talk about one more rate. So the environmental lapse rate, you send a weather balloon up, and it may or may not be 6.5 degrees uh, Celsius per kilometer uh, cooling. The dry adiabatic rate's pretty much in stone. The wet adiabatic rate, there's actually some um, play in that. The wet adiabatic rate says that when you begin condensation, I'll point at this cloud, and I'm going to go ahead and erase this, because when you begin condensing, we said a certain amount of energy is released. So guess what? It's going to rise and expand, okay? But it is going to expand, it's going to cool, it's going to cool because it expands, but now instead of 10, it's going to cool at 5 degrees Celsius. So this last one on my figure, I'm going to draw a cloud up here. It's condensing. And now instead of cooling 10, according to the dry adiabatic rate, it's going to cool 5. And the children that point you so it, just a minute, let me finish this, okay? So 12 minus 5 is 7 degrees Celsius. So that would be the temperature of that chunk of air up there. One more thought. So this right here, what I said, this minus 5, that is called the wet adiabatic rate, or the WAR, sometimes called the moist adiabatic rate. Okay, what was that? At the higher altitude, shouldn't that be the time when ice crystals start forming? 
Yeah, somewhere in there. Yep. So I'm just saying condensing. So cloud. Yep. You're right. And then you get a static charge from the friction of the Yeah. So let's see that in action, okay? So do you see the lifting? What elevation is the lifting condensation level? Where is it? Where do you see a cloud? Me too. That is the LCL. 3,000 meters, 3 kilometers, same thing. So in this example, again, 32, okay? So notice that those first three, those first, let's see, one, two, the first three kilometers it rises, it's going to cool according to the 10, okay? Now when it begins condensing, it's going to cool according to the 5. So 2 minus 5 is negative 3. Yeah, I have to concentrate. Exactly. Okay, and then what's negative 3 minus 5? <coughs> negative 8. Exactly. So, does that work for you? <coughs> I think so, too. Yeah, if you're in a plane, you can hit by lightning, lose 2,000 feet right away. Yeah. That's fine. I can imagine. We need to talk then about how do you get that chunk of air to rise, and there's three ways. Excuse me, there's four ways. Okay, if you can if you can get it to rise, it's going to expand and going to cool. So how do you get it to rise? Okay, and here they are. We're going to talk about all four of these. But basically, orographic lifting has to do with mountains. Uh, frontal wedging has to do with bumps. Um, convergence has to do with if, you, if something converges on a spot, maybe you kind of think of this, it all comes to one spot, that's convergence. And we talked about the last one, the, the, the localized convective lifting already. So how do you get a chunk of air to rise? Starting with ore graphic lifting. I'm going to have a figure to go with this. Ore graphic lifting again has to do with mountains. And the figure is actually going to go something like this. We've already uh, talked about how you're familiar probably with our weather generally comes from the west. In our latitude, we are under the influence of a prevailing westerly wind. So basically, it slams against the um, the counties, slams against the Rockies or the um, Sierra Nevada mountain range. Okay, and slamming it can't go through the mountain, so basically it has to go up. So it's forced to go up. So, so air is forced to rise, whether it wants to. Buoyant or not? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That same kind of. Yeah, I agree. Same theory allows mountain ranges to produce instant weather. Yeah, I agree. The next type of lifting mechanism, um, I'm going to. I don't think I'm going to bring up the weather map. That's what that hot thing is. But um, you need to miss one on the orographic. You guys told me what color is a cold front? Cold or blue? It is cold front. Cold front is cold. <laughs> what color is a is a is a is a yeah. warm front? <laughs> Red. Exactly. So we'll talk more about weather fronts in another unit. <coughs> but this kind of introduces you again to when when you see that blue line, what is it? <coughs> Basically, the blue line is a cold front. So basically, from probably the north-ish for us anyway, we have a chunk of cold air that is moving forward. That creates a cold front in front of it. And like this slide says, um, cold front or warm front, cold air is just more dense than warm air. Hot air rises, right? Okay. So that cold air is going to hug the ground, and it's basically going to act kind of like a snow shovel. And so everything in front of it goes up. So that's the lifting mechanism. It's frontal wedging. Now, if it's a warm front, basically that means that our, our um, probably we have a chunk of air that's coming from the south for us, okay? So the chunk of air is on the move, okay? And that's the only difference between a warm and a cold front is who's on the move. So a warm front, warm air is on the, on the move. Now, that cold air in front of it is going to hug the ground, so that warm air is actually going to kind of go up and over, okay? But again, it's lifting. So that's kind of how that goes. Those are the lifting mechanisms. So here is a figure that basically has two air masses. You kind of see the cold one on your right and the warm one on your left. I don't necessarily even know which one's being the aggressor. It could be a stationary front. 
But the point is basically right where, they call that the transition zone, right where your chunks of air masses are meeting, that's where the lifting's gonna go on. So lifting, expanding, cooling, condensation. In large scale events, hurricanes and tornadoes, the same events concurring, yes, but uh, how does the, the air fluctuate to actually cause these events? Well, well, I guess we'll have to kind of talk about that when we talk about global size events, but yeah. I'm always jumping ahead of the whole time. <laughs> I don't know. Jumping ahead. Um, so convergence was the third of four. Convergence means, um, I like to give the example when we talk later about basically if you go out on a playground and you have a bag of candy, you have like a bunch of, you know, six-year-olds, you throw the candy out, converge, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> pile up. Same story so. in Burger King. You take about twenty, about $2 and a quarter to go in the Burger King kids section and super food to the floor. <laughs> That's cruel. <laughs> so convergence, kids busy convergence can can act as a as a uh, situation to go ahead and make uh, the chunk of air rise. So we'll talk about this later too. That actually land mass, like um, Florida here, is almost like this little peninsula, right? And so the difference between kind of the the roughness of the land versus the smoothness of the sea, actually, that can actually kind of help some of this pilot. That and uh, prevailing winds. So we can definitely have convergence over Florida, as you're seeing there. Lift, get a chunk of air lifting, it cools, and it can cool to its con uh, dew point temperature, and condensation occurs. And then this last one, like I said, I think we looked at before. Um, we said that, you know, I love spring, and I love, I love the summer even. Look at the different kind of plots of uh, planted uh, crops. But anyway, you can have a chunk that's basically kind of darker than the rest. It has a lower albedo than the rest. It kind of has a hot spot, so it creates kind of a nice toasty chunk of air. Toasty relative to its surroundings. So that makes it less dense, and it's going to want to rise. And we'll be talking more about this with regard to stability coming up here in a minute. Um, so that, again, is, is a, another mechanism to get a chunk well, of air to rise. On a large scale in the yeah. That's a storm. So here's actually a small localized scale. Um, factories, uh, they have emissions, right? Their emissions oftentimes are nice and warm and toasty. So that ge just generally means that that chunk of air being emitted from that smokestack is going to be less dense than the air around it. So it's just naturally going to go up. But did you know, oftentimes when you look at smokestacks, um, the, one of the byproducts of combustion is just simply water vapor. So some of that smoke and icky looking stuff is just water vapor. <laughs> so, yeah. Right, the smell would be something, would not be water vapor. There's cases, though, where uh, so, there, I think Pennsylvania had an uh, iron factory there that's an aluminum factory, and they vast they valley, which caused a cap on sure. the valley to form. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, then a low pressure rolled into the valley and actually took this cap with it. Oh, okay. So... The entire valley got filled with this toxic fog. Yeah, that 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 happens. We'll talk about that too later. So, have you ever seen like birds soaring? And birds actually are great at kind of finding these actually natural thermals, not necessarily a thermal from the from Roquette or something like that. So, so I love like by Roquette, and sometimes it's like Yeah, yeah. Um, so this actually is most like convective lifting, if you think about it. These hot air balloons are just amazing to me, that basically they just, as far as I know, just use regular air. They heat that air, they control the heat to control its density. Um, so basically this is hot air inside and cooler air outside, and that's what makes it want to rise. It's so cool. They can only go one direction. They can cool it down, too. I was going to say, they can come back down. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah um, come back so down, but that okay. actually leads us up. into this, the hot air balloon idea. Okay, hot air balloon. Okay, basically, um, <clears throat> if you're in a hot air balloon, you are um, in an unstable situation. The chunk of air within that balloon is warmer than its surroundings, okay? Parcels of air in the atmosphere do that, too. Okay, that chunk of air would be unstable. If your chunk of air is cooler than its surroundings, it's going to want to fall. Okay, and that is actually what we call stable air. 
So we're leading up to three general types of the stability of the atmosphere. So if during like a severe weather event, you kind of plug into meteorologists, a lot of times they would use the word that the atmosphere is unstable. Okay, and that's actually what we're talking about here. That's one of three possible situations of the atmosphere. The atmosphere can be absolutely stable, absolutely unstable, or conditionally stable. Okay, and it all just depends, and I'll tell you how we can know that. We can know those three conditions, and I think I'll draw them over here, if we know this. This weather balloon stuff, okay, what we're going to see is what the atmosphere is doing actually will tell us which of those three conditions that we're in. Um, so now what you're going to have to see me do, and I do this you know, at times when I'm teaching physical science, I'm going to have to backtrack on this. Notice the number approximate, very approximate. Okay, we're going to be changing this number, six and a half degrees Celsius cooling for every kilometer you rise. Um, the other thing I want to mention, because I think it's been in your notes, but I haven't really mentioned it much, is you guys told me in unit one that if you're in the troposphere and you're going up, what's the temperature doing? It's dropping. It's getting cooler. Exactly. If you're in the troposphere and you're going up, and instead of it getting cooler, if it's getting warmer, that's what we call a temperature inversion. The word inversion means kind of flip-flopped. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's look at a stable situation. Stable must mean that the chunk of air is cooler than its environment. So I like what your author's done. Basically, on all of these figures, you're going to see over here on the left these numbers. And these are what your weather balloon spit back. Your weather balloon, like this says, said, and it doesn't have to be this constant, I don't think. But your weather balloon said, for every kilometer I rose, it cooled 5 degrees. So it went from 25 instead of 6.5. Remember I told you? <laughs> so it went from 25 to 20 to 15. That's what your weather balloon said on all these figures. Here's our chunk of air, and one of the lifting mechanisms is in place. I'm not sure which one, but you're going to get your chunk of air to rise. I don't see any clouds, so you're thinking the dry adiabatic rate? Me too. Okay, so it goes from 25 to 15, from 15 to 5. Yes. So the way we assess the stability of this parcel of air in this atmosphere is at each elevation comparing it to the temperature of the environment. So that's what your author's done. So here it's the same temperature. We got it to rise. Here, notice 15 is 5 degrees cooler than 20. So we say it doesn't have a tendency to rise because it's cooler. It's the opposite of a hot air balloon, right? Mm -hmm. At uh, 2 kilometers, now you're looking at 10 degrees cooler. So it's 5 degrees versus 15. Okay, So it's really cooler. Good thing this is not a hot air balloon, right? <laughs> Okay, so we say the tendency here is not to rise. It's a stable, stable um, atmosphere with this parcel of air. Yes. So the tendency is actually to fall. Not to say you can't get the lifting to go on because you can have convergence or, you know, probably convergence is going on here, I think. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and write over here these three conditions of the atmosphere. And we'll just see. Starting with absolutely stable. And they all have to do with the environmental lapse rate. Okay, The environmental lapse rate is less than the wet adiabatic rate. Yes. Um, so here's how we would write that mathematically, right? The ELR, this is what your weather balloon said, okay, is less than the WAR. That's the WAR. The WAR, exactly. And I'm going to go ahead and I told you that the wet adiabatic rate was 5. I'm going to go ahead and write 5 or 6. The wet adiabatic rate 
the temperature, if you have condensation going on, that, that um, your chunk of air is going to cool is either going to be 5 to 6 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And I'll show you why that is here in a minute. Okay? So, this parcel of air, the, air, the chunk of air in that environment is going to be absolutely stable. I'm going to show you an example. And absolutely stable, like we saw a minute ago, means that basically at all elevations, that chunk of air is going to be cooler than its environment. Okay. So what kind of, what kind of, can you tell, what kind of lifting mechanism do we have going on here? What's it look most like? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Frontal wedging? It looks like frontal wedging to me, too. Can you kind of see the, the, the cold air here on the left, excuse me, on the right, and the warm air on the left? The yeah, yeah, frontal sure. wedging. So this is an absolutely stable environment. Okay, and for it to be absolutely stable, we need that those numbers there on the left that our weather balloon says, we need those to be less than the wet adiabatic rate. And this is where I need to tell you that your author here in a minute when condensation occurs is going to show a wet adiabatic rate of 6, not 5. And I looked it up and actually I, I, I marked it on your class Twitter feed to show you why that is. But if, it is a, if you do send up the weather balloon, the ELR is 5, it looks like this. So it goes from 20 to 15, etc. Okay, so that's your 5. And like I said, here in a minute, can you kind of see the little bit of clouds maybe at, tw uh, at 2 kilometers, 2,000 meters? That actually is going to be your lifting condensation level. And that's where you're going to see it start cooling at 6 instead of 10. Okay. So for until condensation happens, about 2 kilometers, okay, it's going to dry, or excuse me, it's going to cool 10. Yeah, at the dry adiabatic rate, exactly, at the DAR. That's right. Okay, condensation occurs, and now we're going with 6, not 5, so 0 minus 6 is negative 6, exactly. Okay, um, from 3 to 4 kilometers, again, it's going to cool 6 degrees, so that puts it at negative 12, and one more kilometer, negative 18. So we can assess its... Um, we can assess its stability at each elevation by looking at the chunk, the, the, the temperature of the chunk of air and comparing that to what the environment is. And what your author's done is in blue right here told you, told you what the situation is. So for instance, if we pick uh, two kilometers, our chunk of air is zero Celsius versus the air is 10. Zero is colder by 10 degrees than the air. Okay, we go up to 3,000 meters or 3 kilometers, you're looking at negative 6, that's your parcel air temperature, versus 5. Again, it's colder. Okay, is it going to rise? Yeah, because you have frontal wedging, okay? But is it going to rise because it's buoyant? No. Okay, so its tendency is to fall. Absolutely stable. And that will always be the case if, when you send up your weather balloon, it's less than your wet adiabatic rate, where if you go with a wet adiabatic rate of 6, you can go with 5 as your ELR. Okay. So what your author does over here is to kind of, I think it's kind of clever. The purple line is what the atmosphere is doing. That's the purple line. That's what your weather balloon said. And kind of the segmented red and blue line is your chunk of air, what its temperature is. Uh, the red is when it's rising at the DAR, and uh, the blue is when it's rising after condensation occurs at the wet adiabatic rate. Okay. So this is my slide to show you we are not going nuts. Okay, this is an earlier slide that said the wet adiabatic rate is 5. <coughs> okay. And here's an, uh, the most recent slide where your author uses the wet adiabatic rate of 6. And like I said, if, you, if I clicked on that link, um, it would tell us that there's play in that rate. There's not as much play in the dry adiabatic rate. All right, let's look at the other one, the one that we all like, unstable atmosphere. 
Okay, it will be absolutely instable or unstable. I kind of go back and forth, forth with this. Absolute instability if your ELR is greater than your DAR. So that's your weather balloon, your environmental lapse rate. If it's greater than your dry adiabatic rate, which is 10. Okay, and I'm gonna, I have an example to show you how that works. Okay, if that's the case, then you will kind of have the whole kind of buoy, sort of buoyancy in your, in your chunk bearings rising. Um, so here's that example. Okay, so your author picks um, the weather balloon went up and it gives us, it says that it's cooling 12 degrees Celsius for every one kilometer. So here's what that looks like. Okay, so it's from 40, minus 12 is 28, 28 minus 12 is 16, minus 12 is 4, minus 12 is negative 8. So what kind of lifting is this? It's the last one. Yep, convective lifting. Convective lifting, very good. Okay, so a chunk of air. Looks like the lifting condensation level, again, about two meters. That's where I see the base of the cloud. So it's going to go up uh, for the first two kilometers. It's just going to rise and cool at the 10. Beginning with condensation, it's going to cool at the 6. So when we have uh, this kind of heating system, are you basically guaranteed a weather pattern? You're guaranteed of instability. Mm-hmm. That's what absolute means. You're guaranteed that if you have a lifting mechanism in place, if that chunk of air is going up, it's basically going to kind of feed on itself, and it's going to be warmer and warmer and warmer compared to its environment. So, like, look at now, the author did again. He compared each, at each elevation, if we just pick kind of maybe the 3,000 meters, okay, at each elevation, okay, he compared the temperature of the parcel of air versus the temperature of the atmosphere, and in all cases, it's warmer. So it is like a hot air balloon. Okay. So the tendency is to rise. And this is actually what's going to create your, and we'll talk more about these next week, your cumulonimbus clouds. It's a lot of vertical development. Exactly. So over here now is the same kind of thing we looked at before with uh, um, the purple line being what the atmosphere is doing and the segmented red and blue line being what your parcel of air is doing. Notice it's over here to the right. It's warmer in all cases. So the last one, conditionally um, stable, we can also write kind of as a mathematical thing up here. So basically your ELR is going to be between your WAR. It's going to be greater than that but it's going to be less than your DAR. <laughs> so like somebody in my night class said, um, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of, what do I say? Did I do that right? Um, it's kind of small. So it's got to be greater than 6, okay, but less than 10. It's very specific. And the conditional part of it, Conditional instability. The conditional part is, does it uh, begin condensing or not? So let's look at the example here. So something between uh, 6 and 10 would be 9. So that's what your author's done. So you can kind of see over there on the left, it's cooling 9 degrees Celsius for every 1 kilometer it rises. Okay, again, we have frontal wedging, making that go up. Looks like the condensing begins at uh, two kilometers again. Okay. So that's all the same or similar. Okay. But notice that if you compare um, before it's condensing to after it's condensing, actually it's that when it begins condensing, kind of that latent heat of condensation, it kind of gives it the extra bump to go ahead and be warmer than the atmosphere. Okay. If it wasn't humid and it never began condensing, 
then you wouldn't have had that issue. So okay. it's actually, the condition on disability is actually stable until the point right. where it... That's what I believe. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's actually, yeah, conditionally stable. But to me, I thought what you were going to say is um, only like before it begins condensing, it's stable. Right. And then after it yes. begins condensing, it's not at some point. Yep. So just a couple last slides to finish up, and then Chapter 4 will be due on Monday. We'll talk more about this. This actually talks about what sort of clouds do you get when your atmosphere is stable. And I'm going to go ahead and draw a flat cloud. That's what this is describing. Um, next week on Monday, we'll call this a type of stratus cloud. Okay. And then um, if your air is unstable, which is everybody's favorite, right, um, then you get a type of, I'll go ahead and draw something with vertical development. There's an anvil. Ugh. I know. So this actually is a type of cumulus cloud, cumulus cloud. And we'll talk more about 10 cloud types on Monday. So exciting. Cumulus cloud, but in some areas you see something cloud wall. So those are cumulus clouds, correct? Um, if you're talking about um, a wall cloud, that actually is a function of some um, cumulonimbus clouds. They drop those sometimes before a tornado then kind of drops out of that. So you're talking about kind of something. I've seen a lot of them. Yeah. Everybody. Mm -hmm. So any questions? Those things are intimidating. So we'll move to again.